My name is Carrie Riddle, and I'm the Deputy Director with the Criminal Investigations and Network Analysis, or CENA Center, uh, DHS Center of Excellence here at George Mason University. And thank you very much for joining us online today for the next session in our Distinguished Speaker Series, uh, where we host a series of talks exploring topics related to CENA's research footprint, which is broadly centered around approaches to understanding and addressing transnational organized crime. As we get started, just a quick reminder to please keep your microphones muted throughout the session today. And following today's talk, we'll have a Q&A session uh, moderated by CENA's director, Dr. Jim Jones. So please feel free to type your questions in the chat at any point throughout the session today. Uh, and for our folks watching through YouTube, please feel free to send us an email with your questions to cena at gmu.edu. As we continue our spring series, uh, please mark your calendar to join us on March 8th for a session on disrupting human trafficking featuring Nick McKinley from Deliver Fund. To learn more about this talk and about other CENA events, please visit our website, cena.gmu.edu. And this afternoon, it is a pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker, Dr. Lauren DeGrieff. Dr. DeGrieff is an Associate Professor of Chemistry with the Global Forensic and Justice Center at Florida International University, where she conducts research on vapor analysis and its detection by canines and instruments. She earned her PhD in Forensic Chemistry from FIU in 2010, and prior to returning to FIU as faculty, she conducted a fellowship at the FBI's Counterterrorism and Forensic Science Research Unit, and served for 10 years as a researcher and principal investigator with the chemistry division at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. Dr. DeGrieff regularly speaks on the dynamics of odor for the operational community and for international scientific conferences, and she's also authored many peer-reviewed publications, holds a number of patents, and is the editor of a book released in 2022 entitled Canines, the Original Biosensor. She's here to share a talk with us today about the characterization and detection of homemade explosives and synthetic opioids by instrument and canines. Dr. DeGrieff, we're very pleased to have you here today. And if you're ready, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you, um, Jim and Sina, for having me. It's so kind of you um, to spend your lunch hour with me. Um, let me just share my slides here, if you don't mind. Give me one minute. Today, we're gonna to be talking about some, a few different research projects that I have done related to homemade explosives as well as synthetic opioids. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I've previously worked at the Naval Research Laboratory for about 10 years, and I've only been at FIU for about a year and a half. So majority of the explosives research was done while I was at the Navy. And then the um, uh, opioid or the fentanyl research has been done both um, at FIU as well as with the Naval Research Laboratory. So before we get going, let's talk a little bit about um, chemical sensing and more um, specifically canine olfaction. So chemical sensing um, is simply when a sensor absorbs energy, generates a signal, and then processes that signal. And olfaction is just an example of that, is a living example of that. So olfaction or sensing through olfaction is how an organism, organism reacts um, to and interacts with the outside world. So this diagram that we're looking at here shows the um, parallel processes of whether you're working with a um, instrumental or other type of sensor, or you're working with a biological sensor such as a canine. The nice thing about canines is that they're more than just a sensor. They have almost the full apparatus that you would expect from a field detector. So they um, sampling occurs, vapor sampling occurs when the dog takes a sniff, this occurs through their nose. And they're also um, lucky enough to have pre-concentration of the uh, odorants or all the vapor molecules that occurs um, in the mucous membrane of the nasal cavity. Um, once they have then interacted with the olfactory receptors that occur in this nasal cavity, you get detection through the olfactory nerves and discrimination um, and um, signal through your olfactory bulb. Um, the reason why I point out this is because I will talk a lot about, about challenges for vapor detection by canine, but the challenges for canines are going to be the same as faced by other types of field detectors. Very briefly, canines have been used um, for hundreds of years 
um, for their natural drive to hunt and locate prey based on its scent. So if you look to the picture on the far right, you look at Barry. Barry was a St. Bernard that worked in the hospice in, Sw the, in Switzerland, and he was a search and rescue dog. They were um, up in the mountains in Switzerland, and there were many um, travelers that would get lost and he would find those and locate those people. Um, there are other um, examples, um, slightly more modern. Um, Sergeant Stubby now has his very own movie on Disney. Um, he was a the first scent detection war dog in World War I. Um, and we also believe that in the 1880s, bloodhounds were first deployed um, by Scotland Yard in order to search for Jack the Ripper. Um, after that period, after the late 1880s, the use of canines expanded rapidly um, in Europe, and then not until the 1970s did it expand rapidly um, in the U.S. But now we can use dogs to detect pretty much anything with a smell, and most things do indeed have a smell. Um, this includes COVID-19. This includes um, mass storage devices, such as thumb drives. Um, it includes uh, more traditional things that we think of, like narcotics, explosives, um, and human detection. So why do we continue to use canines? We've invented all of these different instrumentations over the over these many decades and hundreds of years. Why do we still continue to use canines? Well, the main reason is that canines are intelligent, mobile biosensors that can be trained quickly to new odors. And compared to instrumentation, they uh, instrumentation, if you have a new odor that you want to um, want it to detect. It might require a software change or some kind of update, or you might find out that your hardware or your uh, sensing material itself won't even work for that new target and you have to change it out. Dogs can be trained very quickly to new odor. Um, if they already understand the act of detection, um, they can be trained to new odor in a number of hours. Um, they're also mobile. At this point, instrumentation, even if we put it on a robot, or a drone of some sort, we still have to have a general idea of where to get that drone. The canine can use um, odor plumes in order to find that target for us. So the strengths, sensitivity, selectivity, trainability, and mobility. So sensitivity um, obviously is detecting the smallest amount of um, your target, uh, in this case, odor as possible. Selectivity is the ability to tell the difference between that odor and many other odors in the environment. Trainability is that ability to detect a new odor or to learn a new odor very quickly. And the mobility we talked about is using those vapor plumes. So let's look at quickly, this is Keela. Keela was a blood detection dog. She can see her handler just stands in the corner and she is told to search these. This is a very, very simple search. Um, this was done at the FBI laboratories. This, um, this dog, her name is Keela, as I said, but her handler is Martin Grime. And you'll see she's looking for a trace amount of blood on carpet. So it's too small to be seen by the human eye, but Keela has no problem finding it and pointing it out for us. So when you think about an instrumentation and you think about a dog that can find human scent, for instance, just as an example, that dog is going to be able to find a unique human scent, which is a complex mixture of odorants at a very trace levels. They're going to be able to follow that uh, trail through maybe grass, maybe asphalt and other odors, uh, maybe, and then they might be able to find that person in a group. That is um, that combination of sensitivity, selectivity, and mo mobility, as well as trainability is something that we have not achieved in instrumentation. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So if you compare a uh, canine to a human, as far as their olfactory bulb goes, what we see is that the surface area for olfactory receptors is substantially larger in the canine than it is in the humans. Um, additionally, it takes up a much larger portion of their olfactory bulb. So if you look at the um, image here, so what you can see here in the olfactory bulb is that it, the um, olfaction is much more important to the dog's brain than it is to the humans, which have a very small portion. In addition to that, the way that the internal odor flow works in a dog's nose um, is much different than humans, and it's very efficient. So there's actually two paths. So for humans, when we sniff and we breathe, it's the same path that goes to the same place. And so what that means is that when we breathe, we dilute whatever it is that we're smelling quite significantly. Dogs don't have this occur. They have one path, which in the picture is this blue path um, that is respiration. 
And then they have a different path for air that is brought in when they are sniffing, and that is the red path. And that goes to this area here at the back of the snout um, towards the brain. That is the olfactory recess where you can sequester and concentrate odors. In addition, to, in addition to this extremely efficient internal odor flow, they also have very efficient external odor flow. So if you've ever looked at, if you have a dog, if you've ever looked at your dog, the dog has little slits on the sides of its nose that humans do not have. And so what that means is that when a dog blows out, it blows out the side and the air go, warm air goes to the back and it actually pulls the odorants in front of it closer to the nose. So let's look at a video quickly. So here we're seeing the dog blowing out to the back. And here's a nice video. These were taken by Matt Stamates at NIST. And you can see the dog sniffing and you can see how that process of sniffing actually entrains. This is acetone coming out of that little container. Um, and it, it is pulled to the nose. And as I said, these are, I should have labeled the slide and I apologize. This is from Matt Stamates at NIST. Um, very nice uh, Schlieren imaging videos that he did here. All right, so we talked about sensitivity. On the selectivity side, we know that there is a large diversity of olfactory receptors in mammals. Um, a pair, Axel and Buck, um, actually won the Nobel Prize in 2004 for determining this large repertoire of um, odorant receptors in the olfactory system. Canines do have more than humans, although not, not a huge quantity more, but we have more functional ones. Many of our genes that express odorant receptors are not actually functional. Dogs have a much higher percentage that are functional, giving them a larger variety of different odorant uh, receptors. But even if there are thousands of genes uh, for different olfactory receptors in our genome and in the canine genome, that's still not enough to encode for the huge possible huge number of possible odors that exist in the world. So uh, further work was done by Firestein, where he showed that it's more of a combinational strategy where they, a single receptor can recognize multiple odorants and a single odorant can be recognized by a multiple receptor. So you get a code of sorts. And this is what allows us to distinguish between thousands of different odors. Now that I spent all this time talking about the strengths of dogs, there are of course weaknesses. There's nothing that's perfect. Um, the number one disadvantage of detector dogs over instrumental detectors is that canines are intelligent mobile biosensors that can be trained quickly to new odors. No, that is not a typo. The um, problem with dogs is that um, we are not, we as humans are not capable of appreciating their um, olfactory world. So it is very easy for dogs to get off track and not know that. And what I mean by getting off track is that I mean that the dogs are, learn some kind of impurity or contamination that um, is not what we want them to find. And it can get them, it can cause them to alert to the wrong things. We call this false alerting. Um, so that can be uh, problematic. Furthermore, there is um, still limited applied research. Um, as far as the people who are doing chemistry for this sort of thing, there's only a few of us that currently work in this field. Um, and then there's also, because of this limited standardization, instruments, of course, of course, are going to be very well evaluated before they go on the market, or they should be anyway. There will be well-established figures of merit. There's going to be methods for calibration. And the mechanism that they use for detection and exactly what those analytes for detection are is, are going to be very well characterized. None of this exists for the dogs. There is currently development for using a calibration type odor um, for dogs. Uh, figures of merit are something that um, can be quite uh, variable depending on the kind of training the dog has had. And then additionally, a lot of the time we do not know what the dogs are detecting. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a few slides. But overall, um, in my field, I've been working in this field of canine detection um, for well more than a decade now. And my goals are to generally better understand the canine as a detector. So what are they detecting and how are they doing it? And then in improve the canine as a detector. So the more we know about how they work and what odors they are detecting, we can create better training methods and better training aids. Um, and we can help them um, increase proficiency by understanding how to generalize from what it is they're training on to what they might find in the field. Um, also, um, more applied approaches or more applied uh, 
uh, needs like um, improving storage protocols and preventing contaminations. And additionally, what I don't have on the slide is that the better that we understand canines, the better that we can design um, other instrumentation that does not require feeding and kenneling and um, things of that nature. So other types of um, instrument-based detection, we can learn a lot from the dogs. I promise I'll be getting to the actual emerging threats, but before we quite get there, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. I've already used the term odorant a few times today. Um, an odorant, my definition of the odorant is that it is a single volatile molecule that has an associated um, odor. So it is the molecule that we're detecting. So in this example, this is um, an incredibly simple um, chromatogram of spearmint, and you get a big peak that is methyl, the compound methyl, methyl salicylate. If you go into your lab and smell methyl salicylate, or if you have a lab, if you smell methyl salicylate, you'll immediately associate that, that with spearmint. So it is the odorant associated with spearmint. However, most of the time it's not that simple and you have a, a variety of odorants that come together and make up a unique odor and that is called an odor profile. So this is a pattern of analytes that, you're, um, that your brain recognizes. So for instance, if you're pumping gas, you might just um, recognize the smell of fuel that is going to be a variety of odorants put together. And here's an example of all of the Headspace products and diesel fuel. So an odor, an odor is a perception. It's not actually the molecules that you're smelling. It is the perception of those molecules. It's the perception of the odorant or the odor profile that you recognize as odor. So it is the spearmint that you're smelling or it is the diesel fuel, it's that recognition. My research methods tend to be very straightforward. I do, oh, a whole lot of gas chromatography, um, which is just simply putting a vapor mixture um, in this case, it's showing a liquid, but for me, I would put a vapor mixture um, into a heated injection port that causes the um, vaporization of any uh, particles or any liquid. Um, and then it, it goes through the GC column. The GC column is going to be coated with um, a solid phase. And uh, the components in that mixture are going to be separated based on their affinity to the column. Um, they're moved through the column based on uh, with helium or nitrogen or hydrogen, depending on um, what detector and uh, what type of column you're using. Um, and then it will be detected most commonly by mass spectrometry. And mass spectrometry basically just fragments whatever molecules are coming out, and it gives us a fingerprint that we can compare to a database and understand. Also, this is a relatively common method in my field. Um, we use something called solid phase micro extraction, which is just a, um, a needle sort that when you hit the plunger, a fiber comes out. It's a polymer coated fiber, and we put it in the headspace, which is the space above whatever we're trying to sample. So let's say we want to know what that blue liquid smells like. We'll put that fiber in the air above that, the headspace above it, and the molecules will um, add or absorb to the fiber, um, we then can remove that and put that into our instrument where it is thermally desorbed. Um, alternatively, um, there are some drawbacks to using SPEMI. SPEMI does tend to pick up certain analytes over others, tends to um, be uh, preferentially pick up certain analytes over others. Um, to get around this, if that is particularly important for the experiment that I'm doing, I might use something like this online cryofocusing trap. Um, and here we have a cryocooled, so very cold trap that sits directly on top of my gas chromatograph. And I can pull whole air. So all of the air that might be above a target in the headspace of a target, I can pull that onto this cooled trap. It will trap there. And then when I tell it, it will rapidly heat up and it will release to the analytes that I am interested in to the GC for analysis. So that was just a very quick overview of my research methods. So let's talk about some interesting stuff. Let's start with it, um, homemade explosives. Okay, so um, let's uh, back up one second and explain, make sure that we're all on the same page with um, what I mean by uh, homemade explosives versus IEDs. An IED or an improvised explosive device is the device itself. It's a non-industrial produced explosive weapon um, produced from readily available materials. Um, this does not have to have homemade explosives in it. Earlier um, in World War II and through the Gulf War, IEDs existed, but as landmines and anti-personnel -person or 
anti-vehicle mines that generally contained uh, nitroaromatic type explosives like TNT, RDX, and PETN. During the Gulf War, these uh, types of explosives were used because there were um, unsecured stockpiles that were available that um, people could get their hands on and use in their IEDs. Um, Furthermore, um, domestically, uh, we see smaller IEDs such as pipe bombs. These generally contain um, low explosives such as black or smokeless powder. Now, after the Gulf War, we start seeing um, homemade explosives used more frequently. As those stockpiles were depleted or the war was continued in other locations, they had to be more creative. And instead they use these homemade explosives, which are explosives material that can be made um, readily from commercially available materials. Um, all these materials are easy to obtain and the explosives themselves are easy to manufacture. There are two main types of homemade explosives. The first being binary, which is simply an oxidizer fuel mixture. Um, types of oxidizers generally include ammonium nitrate, potassium chlorate, urea nitrate, um, as well as other oxidizer salts. Excuse me, and examples of fuels include um, basically anything with a carbon and um, as well as some powdered metals. These are just intimate mixtures. There is no actual synthesis required. On the other hand, you have peroxide explosives, which do require some simple synthesis. The two most common are triacetone triperoxide, TTP, and um, hexamethylene triperoxide, diamine. I apparently left the rest of that word off. I apologize. Um, which is HMTD. Now, there is a huge wealth of uh, research that has been done on traditional explosives. Um, there are challenges to detecting uh, traditional explosives. Um, in particular, they have a very low vapor pressure and they tend to be what we call, we're, we're gonna refer to as sticky, meaning that they tend to interact um, with whatever material or sorbent type materials uh, nearby, which further reduces the availability of odor. So they can be very difficult to detect for that matter, um, for that reason. However, there's been quite a bit of explosives and uh, I'm sorry, research and advances that has taken place. Um, I put this list of of references below just to show that there's just a huge amount, but obviously this is just um, the tip of the iceberg as far as the amount of research that has been done. Um, so there's been a huge number of basic measurements done on those materials, um, what the vapor profiles or the odor profiles are, how that odor is transported, um, how to generate these odors to do testing. Um, there's a variety of different sensing materials and most new detectors today are still made um, focusing on the detection of TNT or other nitro aromatic compounds. Um, and also plastic explosives that contain RDX, for example, will have um, volatile tagants in it. Um, these volatile tagants are high, highly detectable by any type of vapor detection system. Um, on the other hand, homemade explosives have had significantly less research in, compar in comparison, and this is mostly due to safety limitations. The, um, because these are homemade, they can be more sensitive and thus more dangerous to work with, and thus most many labs um, do not allow uh, work to be done with them, um, and or labs or um, academic institutions. So there is uh, limited data. Um, that being said, there are very large challenges with uh, detection, vapor detection of these. For the binary mixtures, you have to worry about the oxidizer itself as it is a salt. It inherently has no or very low vapor pressure. In addition to having an oxidizer with a very low vapor pressure, those are often combined with a very high volatility fuel, which can make it harder to detect that oxidizer. Um, additionally, there might be changes because it is homemade um, and not made in a standardized manner. Those vapor, those odor profiles may not be stable over time or temperature. There's an infinite number of mixture options and your sensitivity is going to be dependent on your component ratio. Um, the peroxides are particularly difficult to work with because they are highly drop and friction sensitive. So you can only work with very small amounts under um, controlled conditions. Um, the sensitivity as well as the purity is going to be depend on the type of synthesis and how um, many steps are being done in that synthesis. Um, they are often not stable over time and um, we'll talk a little bit about the difference in vapor pressure between HMTD and TTP in a moment.
Let's first talk about, um, so we generally focus on detection of the oxidizers. So let's focus on potassium chlorate. Potassium chlorate, as we mentioned, is an oxidizing salt, thus having negligible vapor pressure. However, we do know that you can train dogs to detect potassium chlorate, which implies that there must be some kind of odorant that is coming off of it. And so we'll, we'll look at um, some research that I've done to determine that in a moment. Um, the potassium chlorate is used because it is often easier to detonate than more common nitrate explosives. Um, and they can have, um, they can be quite sensitive and even approach primary explosive sensitivity. Um, you can get potassium chlorate directly from a firework supplier, or it can be made from a variety of other commercial items. This is a video of heated potassium chlorate, and you just put a gummy bear in it, which is your sugar. That's your source of fuel, and you can see that it is quite reactive. And here is a video of some guys thinking they're going to play with potassium chlorate and sugar and some deck cord. And you can see that the explosion ends up being more powerful than they had planned and it knocks their camera over. So it can be quite an effective explosive. So as I said, um, cl the chlorate salts have a negligible vapor pressure. So what are the dogs using to detect them? So we wanted to figure out what is in the headspace? What is that odor? So we purchased um, industrial grade or firework potassium chlorate, um, laboratory grade potassium chlorate, and then we also made potassium chlorate from match heads, which is just um, a matter of dissolving the match heads um, in boiling water and separating out the dyes from the and the wood sticks from the potassium chlorate. So what we found is that this there are minimal components in that headspace. So there's minimal, minimal potential odorants. If you look at the chromatogram that we see here, each peak you see is something different in the headspace. There's an internal standard there, so we're gonna ignore that. Um, there is a large peak specifically coming from what we're calling the clandestine potassium chlorate or the matches. That's acetic acid that is coming from the wood and not from the, the wood from the matchstick, not from the potassium chlorate itself. If you look at the table below, you are seeing the um, smaller things that we did see um, in the headspace of these three materials, and you can see there's nothing in common. So if the dogs were, for instance, trained on that clandestine material and they do, they might learn that acetic acid, but then they would not readily generalize or readily detect the laboratory grade or industrial grade, and that can be problematic. But we, we do believe that dogs are doing this, so we wanted to um, for, uh, go a little further. And so there was um, a previous uh, study that was not published, but it was, uh, there was, it was presented that indicated that there's potentially chlorine in the headspace of potassium chlorate. Now, there is no reason that there should be chlorine. Um, potassium chlorate does not um, vaporize until extremely high temperatures, um, but there, this was thought to be detected. So we had to set up um, a, a method to detect this. Um, and for this purpose, we used um, we had to use derivatization. So what you see here is my spemi fiber. It goes in the vial with a derivatizing agent. In this case, it was um, ethylene oxide. Um, goes in the derivatizing agent. That then goes in the jar that has the potassium chlorate in it um, for an overnight sampling. And then we also use an internal standard in the third step. And um, this is looking at the laboratory grade um, potassium chlorate. So what we see in the chromatogram on the bottom um, is, please excuse the lack of um, access labels. I think that fell off at some point. Um, so you're seeing um, uh, the derivatizing agent, which you should see, the internal standard, which we should see, but that's not terribly interesting. But we are now able to detect derivatized chlorine and bromine. Um, you can see that in the cutout here also. Um, so in indicating that both of those compounds are present um, in the vapors, in the vapor above the potassium chlorate. Um, so we looked at the difference in the amounts through the different types of potassium chlorates, and that's what's here on the uh, left. The first graph, you're seeing that laboratory grade. This is from the chromatogram that I showed in the last slide. So you're seeing chlorine present. Um, significantly more in the material I produce, I purchased from the fireworks store and uh, a fair amount more in that from the clandestine. And this is statistically different than the amount that we saw in the blank because there was some chlorine that was detected in the blank. Now, if you look at the graph on the right, the graph on the right shows um, 
uh, the chlorine that was detected from our potassium chlorate here on the far left compared to other salts. And as you can see, the other salts were not, dis, um, not different than the blanks, but the potassium chlorate was the only one that had significantly more chlorine than the blank material. So for this reason, we do believe that the dogs are using chlorine um, probably in combination with other um, trace levels of odorants that we're just not able to see in order to detect the potassium chlorate. Now moving on to ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate um, is uh, another oxidizing salt, which um, should not inherently have a vapor pressure, but it does um, decompose with ambient humidity, um, leading to a low amount of ammonia available in the headspace. Um, ammonium nitrate can be commercially purchased as a fertilizer. Um, it's generally sort of prills, which is little small round balls, um, but is more effective um, in the ground form as it has a greater surface area for the fuel to interact with. You can also, in addition to, or like potassium chlorate, you can get laboratory grade, you can get industrial grade or fertilizer. You can also find it in cold packs, um, the instant cold packs. Um, in order to, to measure ammonia from ammonium nitrate, we also had to do another derivatizing um, reaction. And so here we use butyl chloroformate with ammonia to produce the product butyl carbamate, which is allowed to, allows us to detect ammonia. So this should give you some appreciation for what the dogs can do. So the fat dogs are often trained in ammonium nitrate alone, and some of them are capable of then transferring that detection um, to ammonium nitrate mixed with fuels. And so what we see here is a chromatogram of diesel fuel. And then we did use that derivatization reaction and we were able to see the ammonium nitrate and it is very small as one would expect compared to the amount of odor that's coming off the diesel fuel. Um, same thing can be done with the aluminum powder. We're seeing a handful of um, acids that comes from the breakdown of the steric acid that's coats the aluminum powder in addition to the ammonia. Now, when you look at the amount of ammonia, um, let's start here on the right. We're looking at the amount of ammonia from different variants, so different places that I have ammonium nitrate was purchased. And we can see that the laboratory grade has the lowest amount, indicating that the more impurities in the um, ammonium nitrate, the more it produces that ammonia. So here, this is a calcium ammonium nitrate that has the greatest, also that um, calcium ammonium nitrate found in the ice packs here. And then this is a fertilizer grade ammonium nitrate that has quite a bit more ammonia coming off of it. This table on the left just basically shows all of the odorous compounds um, that we found above the different types of ammonium nitrate that are not supposed to be there. So they have no reason to be there other than being added during the manufacturing process at trace levels. So if you were to train the dog on this calcium ammonium nitrate, for instance, they might not necessarily, if they key in on these compounds, they might not necessarily find the laboratory grade and vice versa. And we wanted to know a little bit more about that. So we wanted to know if you train the dog on the laboratory grade, as many people do, um, would they be able to detect um, the other variants? And so we did this and we used 15 um, sport detection dogs. So these dogs were all given ammonium nitrate to train on and then tested on the other variants. And what we found is that um, the dogs were able to find their own training aid at about 83% success rate, but they were only able to detect the other novel ammonium nitrates uh, variants at 53%. Uh, so that would be below what we would consider proficient. And this ranged from 35% for the um, prilled fertilizer grade to 59% for the calcium ammonium nitrate. Um, we not not one of our 15 dogs alerted to all of the variants we gave them and most alerted to less than three. Um, and what we learned from this is that the dogs are this 59%, the dogs are most likely to detect the calcium ammonium nitrate, which had the most odor. And they were as well as the industrial grade, which had the most similarity, the most in common with the laboratory grade. So it was a combination of um, similarity to what they were training on, as well as just quantity of odor. Um, one thing we also learned from this is that um, the different dogs alerted to different materials. So that um, it was a very individualized process and the way the dogs experienced and internalized that odor um, and leads to different types of det or different detection by each individual dog. All right, now moving on to some peroxide explosive research. Um, Again, looking at TTP and HMTD, which are both high explosives and they require chemical synthesis, unlike the um, mixtures I spoke about previously. Um, they have um, 
commercially available starting ingredients, but do require that synthesis um, that can be done at home. Um, and they can be made from a variety of different um, variations of those starting ingredients. Um, they can be quite difficult to train and work with because of their um, sensitivity. Also variations due to um, different ways of manufacturing as well as different sources for the precursors. Um, the sensitivity can depend on purity and age um, and whether they were made clandestine or laboratory. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. Um, so TATP is made from acetone hydrogen peroxide and an acid catalyst. Um, there is no special equipment or skill required for the synthesis. Um, you can see it being done here in a uh, makeshift lab in somebody's home with a blender and a pot. Um, it's been used in a, a variety of uh, high profile bombings, including the Manchester um, concert bombing and the Brussels airport bombing. Now, um, on my side of things, I love TTP because it is very easy to detect in the vapor phase. TTP itself has a very high vapor pressure. Um, it does not change dramatically. This vapor signature does not change dramatically over time or with formulation. Um, a less pure TTP is going to have um, acetone present and it might have some of this DATP or diacetone triperoxide present. But no matter what, there's always a very large TTP peak for the dog to key in on. The biggest concern that if you were a dog handler is that you would want to make sure that the dog learns to not detect or not hit on acetone. HMTD, on the other hand, is much more complicated. Um, HMTD is very, very low vapor pressure. Um, however, it luckily for our benefit, it does decompose quite readily under ambient conditions into um, highly odorous compounds that include trimethylamine, which has a fish smell, formic and acetic acids, and formamide and dimethylformamide. Um, we spent quite a bit of time looking at HMTD. Um, it's quite an interesting compound. So this is showing um, in these graphs, it shows how the odor changes over time with both clandestine made and laboratory grade made materials. Now in this circumstance, the clandestine and laboratory grade materials were made um, um, in, with the same manufacturing process, although they were made with different ingredients. Um, so one thing you'll notice in the clandestine grade, with the fresh material, you're seeing a very high amount of formaldehyde that you don't see in the laboratory grade. But something to note here is that as it ages in both of them, you start to see this blue line right here. So I should back up for a second. Um, each of these bars here in the bar graph represent the odor at a specific time when I did the testing. The color of the um, part of the bar is related to the chemical we saw in the headspace, and the size of the bar is related to the amount. So as you could, so this is a really good visual wave for looking at how odor changes over time, as um, we tend to be much more visual creatures than we are um, olfactory based. So now that I backed up, so moving on, um, so we see this really um, small amount of this blue here. This is trimethylamine. This is really important because trimethylamine, at least for humans, we have a very, very low threshold to detect trimethylamine. So what that means, sorry, that's your formaldehyde. So what that means is that that fishy smell, we can smell a very tiny amount of it and it quickly becomes overwhelming. As a human, when I smell this aged um, HMTD, the only thing I can smell, even though there's a fair amount of formic acid in it, the only thing I can really smell is that fish smell from that trimethylamine. So what this indicates to me is that if the dogs are working in a similar way that the that I am as a human, is that they are smelling a formaldehyde type smell at the beginning with fresh material. And, and then if it's laboratory grade, a more um, formic acid based acidic smell. And then later you're going to have that fish smell. So it's potential that the dogs, if trained on fresh, would not find aged and vice versa. Now we have not tested this, so I can't say that that is for certain. Um, but more interestingly, um, when made with the same material, so this is it, the first graph was um, same manufacturer, but different materials. This one is different manufacturers. So we have a professional chemist made supply B and supply A is um, just a clandestine synthesis made by somebody who is not a chemist. Now here we use the same ingredients to make the HMTD, but we got very different profiles because of the way that supplier B recrystallized the TATP multiple times and then also washed the, the crystals. So what we see with supplier A is that it degrades quite rapidly, producing that formic acid. 
creating a huge amount of odor. If you look here, this X axis goes all the way, or this Y axis goes all the way up to 25,000. Compared to supplier B, where we don't see that rapid degradation of the um, HMTD, we're not creating those acidic compounds. And we see, as you can see, the y-axis only goes up to 16 here. So significantly less odor overall. So this could obviously uh, create a big discrepancy in the canine uh, ability to detect one if they're trained on the other. So the summary of my HME portion um, is due to the unique and diverse chemistry of HMEs, their vapor signatures tend to be more complicated than the traditional explosives, and thus we should spend more time looking at it. Um, they tend to be dynamic over time and environmental conditions. Um, an additional effort should be placed on working with these materials um, and understanding these materials to improve detection capabilities. This is what the dogs are more likely to see in the real world, and thus this is something that we should have all the research um, information out there that to support handlers um, to better train their dogs and also to start looking at other types of detection methods. All right, now moving on to fentanyl. Um, this fentanyl work was done under the National Institute of Justice, so we will give their disclaimer here that implies that none of the opinions, findings, or conclusions or recommendations are, are um, those of NIJ or the Department of Justice. So I think we've all probably heard of fentanyl today. It is a Schedule II synthetic opioid, um, substantially more potent than heroin. Um, it is uh, manufactured illicitly to and mixed into other drugs or pressed into counterfeit pills. Um, now, there, there is obviously a legal use. That's why it's a Schedule II and not a Schedule I. But most of the fentanyl that is on the streets is coming from this illicit uh, manufacturer. Um, there are also fentalogs uh, or fentanyl analogs, which are structurally related opioids um, that are, are designed to mimic the effects of fentanyl, um, but most of them have no medical uses and thus are schedule one. Um, carfentanil is probably one of the scarier ones it is, as it is um, a large animal tranquilizer and 100 times more potent than fentanyl. So if we were designing an approach to detect fentanyl, it would be fortuitous if that approach could also detect the fentanyl analogs as well. Um, so fentanyl detection is particularly challenging. Um, DEA recommends that all suspected substances are all uh, substances suspected of having fentanyl in it to be handled with caution by trained personnel with proper PE, PPE, which will include uh, at minimum a dust mask, eye cover, and gloves. Um, so non-contact detection would be great. If we could do any type of detection method that does not involve touching the fentanyl would be wonderful. And I know I'm a little short on time, but I do wanna briefly um, tell a story where I had, uh, my students were working with fentanyl in the lab. They followed all the proper SOP um, protocols, but there was really kind of a freak accident that happened with a piece of tape being stuck um, to one of the vials and the vial fell on the floor, it broke. They cleaned up all of the fentanyl again, um, just perfect with the SOPs. But the final step was to wipe down the area with an alcohol wipe. My student did that um, and she cut her glove with a piece of glass she did not see. She got a almost non-visible amount, a trace amount of fentanyl on her skin um, through a cut and did um, immediately start having um, effects from the fentanyl. Uh, which we had to um, take care of. So it is um, it is quite uh, important that we were we would come up with some kind of non-contact detection method. Um, current methods in the field tend to be uh, involve some kind of contact, particularly uh, colorimetric methods. You have to um, interrogate that solid in some manner, and that puts the law enforcement or first responders that are dealing with it at risk. However, if we want to look at vapor detection, fentanyl has a very low vapor pressure and thus is not likely to be detected in the vapor phase. Um, so our research first started by identifying the volatiles in the headspace of fentanyl um, to determine if there was anything we could use as target analytes for identification of fentanyl. So that's what we're showing here. So in this project, we um, determined what the vapor signature or the odor profile of um, fentanyl is. And then we decided instead of we're going away from canines, we're going to focus on IMS detection. So this is a field portable detection method that already exists. Um, and normally it's done for uh, swiping um, a residue, but we it does have um, vapor detection capabilities. So that's what we're focusing on. Um, we did this because of the safety for the canines, um, but we also do have interest in making non-hazardous um, 
uh, fentanyl training aids uh, based on our results. So the way I'm thinking about this is that we wanted to think like a dog. We wanted to figure out what are those key signatures that the dog would be keying in on and can we get our instrument to key in on that instead? So the first thing we did was we purchased a fentanyl reference material and to lo and behold, it did indeed have um, several volatile compounds in its headspace. We were thrilled to find this. So this is a chromatogram here with a variety of different compounds. Um, but just because we saw these compounds in the reference material, they weren't necessarily coming from fentanyl. They could have been coming from um, the manufacturing process, from the container that it was being shipped in. Um, so we needed to make sure that we could uh, focus in on materials that we knew were related to fentanyl. Um, a few things that we to note here is not, peak number seven is MPP, which is a ingredient used in the synthesis. Um, also, N-phenylpropanamide is a known degradant of fentanyl. So the next thing we did is we obtained um, a variety of different materials from the DEA special testing labs, big thank you to them, and the Maryland State Crime Lab, and another big thank you to them. So they allowed us to use, these are five milligram samples, and these were all, all mixtures. Now we knew the percentages that we were looking at with, from the DEA lab, but we did not know the percentages of the mixtures from the Maryland State Crime Lab. We also looked at six different fentalogs for the presence of both MPPA or MPP. So in the, um, in the uh, confiscated samples, we did not find MPP in any of them, but we did find MPPA in most of them with the exception of the, this particularly diluted sample. Um, the, yes, the very highly diluted samples. Um, we did not find the MPPA. I tend to think, or as well as the one that had acetylfentanil, I tend to think that other than the one with acetylfentanil, that if we had a greater quantity than five milligrams, we probably would have detected the MPPA. Now, um, and the fentalogs, as I mentioned, acetylfentanil is the only one that we did not detect MPPA. We did detect MPP instead, um, as well as from the 4-ANPP. Remifentanil is the only one that we did not detect the presence of either. And again, I. Um, would it would be worth looking to see if a larger quantity of remifentanil um, did produce uh, either of those odorants. So then we moved on to working with this commercial. Um, this is a rapid scan uh, or morpho, depends on what brand you want to call it. Um, the company's changed a few times. Um, IMS. Um, so as I said, this is generally used for particle sampling, but it does have vapor sampling capabilities. So for our initial laboratory um, setup, we attached some swage lock and some tubing onto a vial that contained whatever our, our um, analyte of interest is, uh, what I'm sorry, whatever our sample of interest is. And um, in that little vial, we placed different mixtures. Uh, well, first we trained, I'm sorry, first we trained the software of the IMS to detect MPPA, which we could say six, six, successfully here. So when the MPPA pops up, the, we would get a drug detected on the screen of the IMS. So we made um, a variety of different mixtures at either one to one or one to 10 ratios with um, common uh, adulterants. And we were able to detect the MPPA in all of those. Um, we then brought it to um, look at some C's drugs. And here are our adulterants here, including tramadol, lactose is acetylfentanyl, um, uh, as well, yes. And um, we did indeed a, get a uh, drugs detected alarm from all of those. We did some false alarm testing and picked a large number of white powders and also legal uh, medications. And we did not get any false alarms to those. Um, and this is uh, another set of confiscated exhibits from the DEA. Um, with concentrations ranging from 7.34% to 20%. These are all border confiscations, so they were on the higher side. And here we were sampling 50 milligram samples and the MPPA was detected from all of them. So where we're going with this. Um, so the next thing that we plan on doing with this particular part of the project is uh, we are trying to improve the detection so we can do um, lower than 50 milligram samples or we can handle even more diluted sam samples. Um, and we'll be doing this by adding a pre-concentrator onto the front end of the um, IMS instrument. 
Additionally, we are going to be working on non-hazardous fentanyl training aids. So instead of training the dog on fentanyl, we'll be training the dog on a non-hazardous component of the headspace of fentanyl. Um, we are currently, we've developed the training aids and we are currently having them tested right now. We hope to have results out in the next month or two. All right, so in this work, we did indirect and non-contact detection of fentanyl uh, using a handheld IMS. Um, I didn't show you the limit of detection uh, data here, um, but we do hope to improve upon that with our um, pre-concentrator in the future. Um, we had no issues with false alarms, um, and we had successful testing of the um, border samples from that the DEA provided for us. And as I said, going forward, working on this pre-concentrator as well as the non-hazardous canine detection training aids. And that is all I have today. I came in really close to 45 minutes, so I'm happy about that. Uh, I hope you all are as well. Um, but before I uh, answer your questions, I would like to thank my funding agencies, which include the National Institute of Justice, as well as the Office of Naval Research, um, my collaborators um, at my uh, formal institution, the Naval Research Laboratory, um, as well as Kimberly Peranich from the Naval Surface Warfare Center, the Maryland State Police uh, Forensic Sciences Division Laboratory, the DEA Special Testing Research Laboratory, and a special thank you to my FIU family and those that directly supported these projects, which include Dr. Kenneth Furton, Dr. Howard Holness, and Leanne Forte. And with that, um, I will leave full screen mode so I can see you all and answer questions.